Okay, so now I want to move on to the last section of this introduction to manual handling and look at the principles of lifting and again how they apply to the veterinary practice workplace. So we're talking here about thinking about spine alignment while lifting and some simple ways in which to ensure that the lift is as safe and efficient as possible. So to work you through this, I've made a short um, vet nursing um, video. It's available online as well. I've put a link to it on the Moodle page and you'll also find it on www.vetnursing.ie. Okay, so that's the video demonstrating the steps in a lift and how to go through them methodically. You'll notice in the first part of the video, I'm talking you through it, so I'm doing it quite slowly, but you can see there at the end where I lift and lower the box in real time, and you can see it doesn't take a lot of time. I'm just mentally running through the checklist in my head as I'm performing the task in a, in a manner that's keeping my spine aligned. So that's something we'll practice in the, in the, manu in the practical session associated with manual handling before you get your certification. But also it's something you can practice at home. So just get, try and get in the habit of aligning your spine and looking forward when you're moving items. You can look down while you're organizing it, but when you're actually doing the lift, you want to use your um, strong leg muscles as much as possible and minimize the amount of stress on the rest of your body. Okay, so the principles of lifting. Um, once you've done that basic lift and it's become something that happens automatically due to muscle memory, then you can start thinking about applying it um, in a variety of different ways. So there's a huge variety of loads and tasks we lift in practice. Um, and sometimes you have to adapt the technique. So for example, items that you have to lift with one hand. So for example, a full water bucket, let's say you're putting into a, into a large animal pen to give them a drink of water. It's not something you can hold in close to your body because you get very wet. So it's going, you're going to lift with one hand instead. Or you might want to carry something on your shoulder rather than holding it in your hands close to your body. So if you take, for example, in this instance, a 20 kilo bag of feed, very common item to um, move around a veterinary practice in your large animal hospital. And there's a variety of different ways in which you can do it. You could, for example, if you had one, use a little hand truck. And you can see in this picture here, this person is carrying it on their shoulder. So if you look at um, how that's working, sorry, now I want the guys to appear, bear with me for a second. This is disappearing on me. Right, technical hitch there, sorry. So looking at how this person is going to carry this bag of feed on their shoulder, a um, couple of things to note about their technique here. It's good because they've got um, gloves on to protect their hands. So they're not going to, um, you know, carrying out 
and you're handling jobs that involve a lot of pulling and dragging it's a good idea to wear protective gloves particularly when you're doing things like a system with surgery where we don't want you to have cuts on your hands that are ingrained with, with dirt and so on in this case um rather than having to use your palms to hold the the bag by putting it on your shoulder your trunk is then carrying the load and your hands are only there to to guide it and hold it in place rather than to actually physically support it and the other thing is if you imagine holding the bag in close to your body in front of you it's hard to see over it whereas once it's on your shoulder you have a clear unobstructed view of where you're going so they're all examples of um, the benefits of in this case choosing to perform the task in this way um, some poorer examples this one's hopefully fairly self-explanatory but you can see that um, you know this dog is at risk of escaping or uh, jumping out of the bag or falling on the way out and hurting itself and could also um, bite either the person carrying it or anybody else who approached the animal if it felt threatened so maybe not a technique to, to write home about so some tips um, for moving um, items physically. First of all, check that the route is clear before you start. Face in the direction of travel. So before you lift up the load, face in the direction of travel. That avoids you having to, to turn around and reduce the amount of work you have to do. When you are turning, turn your feet rather than twisting your knees or back. And that reduces the amount of rotational force that's being placed on your body. Make sure you can see where you're going. Um, if possible, minimize the distance you have to cover. So for example, try and get deliveries dropped off close to the storage area rather than the opposite end of the building, for example. And again, really just, it's a question of common sense and thinking ahead um, as you navigate your way through the daily tasks rather than rushing and you know, not, not thinking about what you're doing or not taking time to, to adjust your technique. Okay, so another question that arises is, what if the load is too awkward or heavy for you to manage on your own? So a couple of options, you could divide it up into sections if possible. Um, you can get someone to help you. So convert one person lift to a two person lift. Um, you could use a trolley or other equipment to avoid the need to lift or move the load altogether. So if it's a patient, you could put them onto a stretcher. Um, if, it's, um, if you have a, say a wheelbarrow available, that might be an option. Or you could ask someone else to do it. So for example, you might have someone that's, let's say it's a day where you've, your back is at you or you've, you're carrying an injury and you just, don't feel up to a particular load, you can ask someone else to do it for you. Just explain to a colleague why well, you might need some help with it. Um, we mentioned a two person lift there. These are where we need two people to, to lift instead of one. They're very handy for heavier awkward loads, but it is really important that you work as a team. So you need to have one person in charge, whether it's two people or eight people, you need to have one person who's going to give the commands and ensure everyone else follows them. Uh, and you need to figure out all that before you start. So you don't want to figure out halfway through the lift that no one's sure what the next command is going to be or which direction you're going to turn in when you get to the end of the corridor. You know, that all leads to confusion, increases the risk of injury. And particularly if a live animal is involved, if you're moving, say, an injured dog is hit by a car and the owner brings it in on a towel and you want to lift it onto the x-ray table, you might need four people, one in each corner of the towel, and you want the animal to stay still and calm. If it moves, it's going to increase the risk of hurting itself further or biting or getting alarmed or scared, which you want to avoid. If the animal feels everybody lifts simultaneously, smoothly, and as a team, it's much more likely to keep still. Whereas if there's hesitation or one person moves and the other person isn't paying attention and gets left behind, that's very likely to make the animal struggle and increases the risk of them getting hurt. So two people or team lifts, particularly when they're involved in a live animal and um, teamwork is vital. We will practice these in the practical session. They look easy, but you'll realize when you start doing it, um, the lift is the straightforward part. It's getting the instructions right before you start is where the skill comes in. So that's something that we'll practice. And it's something to, to be aware of, as I say, particularly vital when you're moving conscious animals, because if you get it wrong, you're much more likely to, to cause them further injury or stress. Here's an example of um, an animal being moved on a, on a stretcher. At first glance, you think that's grand. Look a bit more closely. There are some aspects of the technique that are good, others that could be improved. So if we take, for example, here a person on the left, they are facing the direction of travel, so that's good. But they're, if you look at their grip, it's rotated. They've, um, they're holding the stretcher with their hands rotated from the elbow, which gives them um, a less secure grip as opposed to the person on the right-hand side here who's holding the stretcher with their palms. You can see their, their forearms are not rotated, so they have a better grip. 
assume when they're moving from um, left to right, this person is walking backwards. So that's not necessarily a problem, but they are then relying on the person on the left who's facing the direction of travel to warn them if they're going to hit something. So for example, if someone suddenly walks up the corridor towards this person, they're not going to see them. They're relying on the colleague to point out to them, just stop a second, let that person go by. So it's important that you're, you're paying attention. And then the other one down here is the fact that this colleague is helpfully holding the door open and clearing the route for them. So it's while there's two people listening, there's actually three people involved in, the, in this procedure. So that's an example of, of good teamwork. Um, other examples, technique here of somebody holding, holding a dog in front of some kennels. Hopefully you look at that and think, oh my God, what are you doing? Um, it's not really that, that safe. Why not? If we have a look. Um, there's no lead on this dog, or if there is, it's at best draped over the person's arm. She's not holding it. So if the dog does get away from her, it's going to be able to run off immediately. Um, there's no control of the dog's head. The dog could turn around and bite her face or her arm. You can see as well, it's paying attention to something over here to the right. So if it decides to spring out of her arms, um, she has no hind limb control. So the dog could use her hand or thigh as a launch pad to launch itself across the room out of her hands. And also she's holding the animal's chest with her arms. So she's putting pressure on the chest and airways. Probably not going to upset a healthy animal, but if this animal had respiratory disease or a cough or dyspnea, difficulty breathing, that could exacerbate it. So that's really a good example of maybe how not to do it. Looking at this one here, two people um, moving a, a bucket of water. So um, the fact that it's heavy, they've obviously decided to lighten the load and share it between them, which is, which is a good approach. But looking at how they're actually doing it, um, I'd be giving this person on the left, as we look at it, more marks than the person on the right. She's got her spine aligned. She's looking up. She's looking ahead in the direction of travel. She's got her hand out to, to balance the weight and they're both wearing gloves to protect the lifting hand. So that's a good sign. And whereas this person, they do have their hand out to balance, but they're looking down. So you can see straight away that their spine isn't aligned to the same extent as their colleague. And they're struggling to, to maintain um, an aligned spine here, which is increasing the risk of injury. So it's just little things like this that you start to notice and become conscious of will over time make you better at uh, lifting and carrying and looking after yourself in the process. So to recap at this stage, we went through the principles of lifting, um, assessing the load before you start, assuming a broad stable base, ensuring that the load is near to you, gripping with your palms and then using your legs and the muscles in the lower half of your body to push the load up rather than dragging it up with your arms, keeping it close to you. And then when you're putting it back down to do so, the same steps in reverse. Once you've mastered that single person lift, then you can adapt it to suit the task at hand and We'll practice two people lifts in the in the practical class. They're not as easy as they seem, so they will require a bit of further practice. Okay, so um, that's the key points on manual handling so far. You'll find more information in the lecture notes. I'll ask you to go through those as well. And bear in mind as well that it is an important part of veterinary practice that we need to be able to look after our patients and our colleagues and our clients and minimise the risk and everybody as much as possible. If you've got questions at this point, um, normally I'd be doing this face to face so you could ask them. But what I'll ask you to do is if you have any quick questions as you go through the notes, please post them on the Moodle forum in the Introduction to Vet Nursing Moodle page. You'll have um, a section a session on Moodle um, in induction week, so you'll be able to find the, the forum. This means that if you put the question there, everybody sees the question and the answer. Um, you'll also get an email notification to your student email so that you'll, you'll be aware the question was asked and you can see the answer or answers. Um, Please don't reply to the email notification because then the only person that sees that is me. If you want to reply or respond to a forum post, please go to the Moodle forum. So log into Moodle and go to the forum um, itself and then you can post a reply there. And again, it'll be um, emailed out to other people in the group so everyone gets to see it. That keeps us all on the same page. It also avoids me getting dozens and dozens of unnecessary emails. So please, reserve email and lecturers um, for you know personal queries that need to be addressed on a one-on-one -on -one basis questions about um, lecture content and practical classes and so on um, they're much better to use the Moodle forum because then everybody sees the answer and benefits from it okay final tip always wear your PPE so we talked about the importance of it I'm going to leave you with this um, picture of, of Melon Cat and ask you to have a go at going through the notes. And as I say, if you have questions, you can post them on the Moodle forum. 
there will be a practical session to follow um, but at this point i'm going to thank you for your attention and direct you to your vet nursing um, email and moodle posts we haven't yet arranged the practical session but when it does we'll be in touch with you to let you know when and where it's on and what to bring and so on so that's it for today. Just to emphasize as well that once you do your practical training, you'll have completed this manual handling certification program, um, which is mandatory for work placement and the certification lasts for three years. So if you're applying say for part-time work in the, in the meantime and they want a manual handling cert, you can use it for that as well. So that can be, that can be useful. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. And we'll be back in touch with information about the practical session once we have it.